Better to die on your feet than, well, if you Google it, you'll see what the end of this quote is. If you go into Wikipedia, you'll get a view about where this quote comes from, but it's wrong. You're going to hear at the end of this talk where this quote comes from, but it fits the theme of recovery very well. One of the points I want to make, though, is that recovery is not just a mental health issue. It applies across medicine. It applies whether you've got orthopedic problems or heart problems. There's nothing specifically mental health about recovery. The mental health focus on recovery, in fact, may have a lot to tell the rest of you here who've got no mental health problems, just what we need to be doing in the rest of health also. The, this talk is as much about any of you here who may be on cardiac drugs or respiratory drugs or gut drugs as it is any of you who may be on antidepressants or the antipsychotic group of drugs. The mental health theme which you hear from patients about how to avoid being powered out is as critical for any of the rest of you who have health care issues as it is for the mental health community. So you've heard talks uh, today from Lex Wonderlink, Martin Harrow, and a lot of you may think that things are improving, that things are getting better. They're going in the right direction if you hear talks like this. I'm here to slightly throw cold water on that. My hunch is that things are not going in the right direction, that they're probably going to get worse rather than better. You hear talks like that today here, but you're not going to hear them on the mainstream media. They're not going to be, these views are not going to be incorporated in the programs you watch on TV or that the 99% of people out there watch. There's a change in the language we use, and here in the room there will be lots of references to people of lived experience, but changing the words doesn't change the reality. And often when people change the words, it's because things are getting worse. It's a token improvement. And in terms of lived experience, just to come back to the point I was making earlier, the issues I'm going to raise are as much uh, matter for all the rest of you who may be on asthma drugs or cardiac drugs, or may have people you live with who are on these drugs, where there's a lived experience element that gets left out of the equation completely. And the challenge I'm going to pose to you is to embrace that. And let's see what we can do about trying to get to grips with it. On the theme of, of are things getting worse or better, this is an email, which you won't be able to read. It'll be in your handouts and things like that, so you can read it later if you want. This is a Canadian TV program maker letting uh, a few of us who were involved in a program that they were making about the antidepressants know that the program's not going to go ahead. And pretty much the same week, this was an email from an Australian program maker letting a few of us who were involved know in the program that the program about the, uh, the antidepressant group of drugs that she was trying to make wasn't going to go ahead. This is going to be an evidence-based program. Nothing that was in the actual program couldn't be fully stood up. But the Australian Broadcasting Corporation weren't going to go ahead with it. Now, just in case any of you think that the Australians are lily-livered or the Canadians are, they were at least trying to make the programs. You guys here don't even try. <laughs> We're in a world that when it comes to the adverse effects that drugs can cause, we've almost reached a stage of Holocaust denialism. That when people commit suicide on these drugs, when there's school shootings, when there's a German plane that goes down, you'll hear about untreated mental illness. You'll never hear about the possible adverse effects of the drugs that the person was on and what contribution that may have made 
to what we're seeing. And the reason you won't hear about it is because there's a close to totalitarian control of the academic media. Forget the media outside, but all the peer-reviewed literature, in, when it deals with drugs that are on patent, whether they're antidepressants or osteoporosis drugs, doesn't matter. This is all almost completely entirely ghost-written. And in all cases, it is entirely written without access to the clinical trial data on which the article's based. There is even more con complete control of the academic media than there is of the lay media. We're in a world where if people talk up about the possible adverse effects of drugs, uh, they know that they're putting their careers at risk. You heard the introductions here today, two or three people have said, you know, we're not anti-drugs, we're not anti-mental illness, um, you know, we believe that drugs can be awfully helpful. There's a cautionary note here where people are trying to say, look, you know, um, we're not being unreasonable here, don't punish us for the things we're saying, and that's because the area for debate has begun to shrink. It's very, very hard to talk about these issues. And again, you guys over here do this better than anywhere else in the world. There's a real McCarthyism. And as with McCarthyism back during uh, the 1950s, it was very, very hard to see how it was going to end. That's the world we're in now. It's very, very hard to see how the academic McCarthyism we have is going to end. When it comes to recovery, the pharmaceutical industry has been there long before the foundation. The recovery message is one that pharma owns. For the most part, the 99% of people out there, considering drugs like the antibiotics and a chest infection, are going to say, well, look, if I'm going to recover from a chest infection, the thing for me to do is to take the antibiotic that I've just been prescribed. Where does psychosocial come into this? And it's very much the same view they have about the antipsychotics and the antidepressants. This is an ad from 15 years ago. I couldn't find the one that I wanted, which actually uses the word recovery right in the middle of it, okay? Industry owned these things. In at the meeting here, Gina, who's organized the meeting and put everything on, is going to be working furiously in the course of all these talks, tweeting out the things that people say, trying to get the message out there. She's going to be up against the pharmaceutical industry who will have hundreds of people tweeting the opposite thing and making sure that any message she puts out gets closed down instantly. We cannot compete against this. I'm involved in a thing called risk.org, which you'll hear about later in the course of uh, uh, the talk. And we're trying to produce a site where people can go to talk about what happens to them on the drugs that they're on across medicine. Industry are there long before us. They've got this extraordinary site if you go into it. It's really people-centered and patient-focused and tries to explain to you all about the drugs in a very professional and smooth way. It's very, very impressive. I got to know about this um, particular site because uh, there was a person who was here until recently today whose father went on this drug, uh, went along to his GP was put on this drug and tried to kill himself soon afterwards. So chasing up the drug, which probably very few of you have heard about, you find that part of the marketing of all these drugs these days is to have a very patient-focused, people-friendly website like this where you can find out everything you need to know about the drug and where you can share your story. So. Um, Whatever about the media programs you saw before, and this is a slightly different tack people take, which is lots of people making programs realize that CBC and NBC and SBC and FBC are not going to feature us. So what we've got to do if we make a program where the good guys get to give their point of view, the kinds of people on the program here today, is we've got to make documentaries, which we have control over, which, which we can release. And here's one here that uh, I was involved in, uh, got to see it, 
and thought to myself, you know, it's a bad idea for me to be involved in this, not because I disagreed with anything that I actually said in the program, I agreed with everything, and the program was very beautifully produced and things like that, but it was a bad idea, a bad idea for a few different reasons. One is the average person out there, if they happen to see this, is going to see a bunch of nice guys like Chris, whom you'll hear later, and Larry, perhaps, and me, uh, saying what we really think about these drugs, the good and the bad. I mean, there are good, there is good, there's also bad, and they're going to hear us give evidence-based views, and they're going to be listening to this, a string of people, like you have on the program today, a string of people giving essentially the same point of view. They're going to look at that, and um, they're going to say, well, actually, you know, there's these guys giving this point of view, but there's a whole lot of other people out there with a different point of view. And in fact, there's a lot more guys who aren't being shown with the different point of view than the few that we're seeing here. And come to think of it, what are these guys doing giving a view that's a minority view? A view that's going to harm patients if patients heed it. They're going to go off their drugs or be twitched about drugs or refuse to go on drugs and they're going to go on and be left with untreated mental illness and maybe commit suicide or do awful things like shoot up a school or whatever. Why is the government letting these guys who look like nice people and seem to be well-intentioned come out with these deluded views? And if you're Australian, you'll add on to the fact and uh, the pharmaceutical industry, if views like this feature on TV or on programs here, well, the industry is just going to disinvest from Australia and we don't want that, do we? So people will end up being, most people, the 99% of people who haven't bought into the message to begin with, are going to end up hostile to people like David Healy, Larry Davidson, Bob Whittaker, you know, even though they appear to be well-intentioned. There's a further aspect to it as well, though, of course, which is giving a view that, for instance, Prozac can cause people to commit suicide, or the SSRIs can cause people to commit suicide, a number of years ago, 15 odd years ago or so, uh, I was faced with the person responsible for public relations for Prozac in the UK who came up to me after a talk on just this issue and said, you're David Healy, I'm so pleased to meet you. You're doing more for the sales of Prozac than anyone else in the UK. <laughs> so the question is, how to stop pharma, how to flummox them? You know, if everything you do just increases the market, what do we do to change things? Well, you're going to, been, this is a bit of the talk where I'm going to potentially cause problems for all of you. I believe in mental illness. I believe in the medical model. I believe we can do great good with all of these drugs. There isn't a single drug that I've ever asked to be withdrawn from the market. I said that it should be withdrawn from the market, not Prozac, not the SSRIs. I'll explain that a little bit more as we go into the talk. This talk is going to zigzag. You're going to think, oh, I'm on board with what Healy's saying here, and then I'm going to zag, and you're going to think, hmm, am I on board with that? Um, well, where I think you'll probably come back to being on board with me a little bit more is there's those of you in the room who won't embrace the, the, uh, won't embrace, uh, the medical model and the idea of mental illness that I have, which is that these are real illnesses. But I think we've got common ground, nevertheless, in what I'm going to call the actuarial model. And this is a model that came into being around 1962 in the wake of the thalidomide crisis. In, in order to try and stop this happening again, what we, lots of well-intentioned people, put in place was a few good ideas. Let's make these drugs available on prescription only. Let's ensure that industry have to prove their drugs work before they get brought on uh, uh, the market. And we'll do this through a new invention, control trials. What could be wrong with that? Well, control trials gave rise to data, and based on the quantification that you have in them, industry have been very successfully able to build risk models and put it to you and me that if we've got a little bit of bone thinning and we've got this drug which reduces bone thinning, that you have a real illness called osteoporosis, and you should be 
taking these drugs for bone thinning. And they'll even feature articles about osteoporosis in magazines for teenage girls. Just as they'll feature articles about Viagra in different kind of magazines for teenage boys, if your penis isn't 100% erect, we've got the drug that can make the difference for this. Just, I mean, you need to take it at the age of 18, just in case you have impotence problems later on in life. In the same kind of way, where for 20 or 30 years after the thalidomide crisis, everybody was very, very aware that when you're pregnant, we need to take great care. Women need to take great care about the things they eat, the things they do, and the pills they take. You do not take pills in a hurry. These days, women thinking about becoming pregnant, even will steer clear of soft cheeses, uncooked meats, fish that might have had mercury. They won't eat fish that could have possibly got mercury in it for ages before they get pregnant. When they get pregnant, they won't go into a jacuzzi. They'll take care about hot showers. But 10 to 15 percent of women here in the United States are on antidepressants, even though antidepressants double the rate of miscarriages, double the rate of birth defects, possibly cause developmental delay in the children born to women who have been on them through pregnancy. How does this happen? It happens because the data from controlled trials set up this risk universe for which drugs are an answer. Now, there's an entirely different lecture on just this. I can't go into it at, at the moment, but I'm happy to answer things about it afterwards um, during the break for lunch. Let me move on because we've got a lot of things uh, uh, to cover. Back in the 1960s and 1970s, when a drug caused problems, doctors picked up the problem quite quickly. If I put Larry on a drug and he turned blue, you see he's turned blue there on this drug, uh, and we halted the drug and the blueness cleared up, we'd write it up saying, look, this drug can cause people to turn blue. Maybe most people don't turn blue enough, but it has the potential to do this. The field would recognize within a year or two of a new drug been on uh, the market that drugs can do this. Now it takes on average 10 to 15 years for a major side effect that drugs are causing to be accepted by the field that the drug's causing it. Why? Because industry are wonderfully able to deploy controlled trial data, which are the gold standard way to hide adverse events, to show that the drug's not causing it. In the 1960s, the idea behind making drugs available on prescription only was that your doctor was going to be rather like a pilot. When you take a flight from New York to Los Angeles, you know that, well, you expect you're going to be able to get there because the, if you go down, the pilot goes down. And her way to ensure that she doesn't go down is to report the near misses that she and counters on any of uh, the flights she takes. The expectation was doctors would do exactly the same thing, but they don't. Where the pilot reports at least 99% of the things that go wrong or that she actually spots, doctors only report 1% of the adverse events that happen to any of you on any of the drugs that you may be taking. And when they do, it gets filed as an anecdote. And when it gets filed as an anecdote, doctors don't refuse to practice until the problem's put right. If you go down, they blame your illness. It was the depression caused her to commit suicide. It's not the pill. I'm Irish, and in the 1980s, we Irish had a, well, for a little bit before that, we had a problem with the English, but in the 80s it came to a head. And uh, there were bombs planted in pubs in England which went off and killed people. Uh, in w one of those pubs in Guildford, four Irish people were picked up afterwards and jailed. And there's a great movie about this called In the Name of the F Father. And uh, what you don't know about the story perhaps is that an awful lot of English people spent a great deal of time working on trying to get these Irish people out. They recognized that an injustice had been done, 
One of the things they ran into in response to their efforts to get these innocent people out of jail was the English legal system saying that if it turns out that these innocent people have been jailed, if we let the world know about this, the public will lose confidence in the legal system. So these guys have to stay there. It's exactly the same thing that happens with anyone who has an adverse event on drugs. If the field recognizes the adverse events, people will lose confidence in the FDA and the pharmaceutical companies and things like that. So it cannot be recognized. And most doctors across healthcare realize this, that if they pipe up and say, hey, this drug could be causing a problem, it's potentially the end of their career. Nowhere more so than in the land of the free and the home of the brave. We're in a world where in the 1960s, 1970s, if I gave a drug to Larry and he turns blue, I'd have no problem figuring it out with him that once we hold the drug and the thing clears up, the drug has caused it. This is objective. This is absolutely scientific. What happens today is if I give a drug to Larry and he turns blue and the evidence base doesn't say the drug can cause him to turn blue, I look to FDA and see what FDA says. Well, in the case of FDA, what we're looking at is a bureaucrat down in Washington who, if they've trained in medicine, has retreated to an office because they don't like meeting people. They may have trained in renal medicine and I'm giving a drug for a heart problem to Larry. And, you know, they won't have trained in this area of medicine at all. They certainly won't have used the drug I've just put him on because it's a new drug and they've been in an office behind a heap of paper for 10 or 15 years. Who is better placed to work out, is this drug causing this problem? Larry and me are the bureaucrat down in Washington. Well, at the moment, the field says it's the bureaucrat down in Washington. So a lot of you know that there's something wrong. And one of uh, the movements to try and put things right at this point <clears throat> focuses on the idea that we're over-diagnosing and over-treating. And this is a cartoon about this issue. You've got this good doctor there. It's a bit like lots of you here in the room who has this Beeper say, oh, they're over-diagnosing things. Too many people have been regarded as mentally ill, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and the hope is that, you know, where in the 1960s, 1970s, people went on, you were rarely on a bunch of pills. You were on a course of one pill or other, which you were on for a few weeks or a few months. That was true of the antidepressants and the antipsychotics. You were not on a ton of pills for life from a very young age. So this all looks wrong to people, and our hunch is we shouldn't overdiagnose and overtreat. Well, my answer to this one is we're underdiagnosing and undertreating. Let me explain. Um, this is risk.org. This is a conflict of interest statement. I'm linked into this, so you need to bear that in mind. What do I mean by the medical model? Well. If you've got a health care problem, there's lots of people that can help you. If you've got a mental health problem, the rabbi, the pastor, whoever can help you. If you've got other health care problems, lots of other people, lifestyle coaches, physiotherapists can give you great advice. You can be advised about your diet and hygiene and things like this. Among the most important people you could, be, you could have once been actually advised by was your grandmother. Um, in terms of ADHD, the pharmaceutical industry know that the greatest barrier to sale of stimulants of ADHD drugs is the presence of a grandmother in the house. But because she'd say, oh, look, there's no point. I mean, you know, it's a crazy idea to give a stimulant to this kid. He's just like his father was at that age. And look, the father's gone on to be a CEO of a health board or whatever. And, uh, you know, hey, we don't want to treat this. This is just boys. Uh, okay, so... <sighs> This is the kind of wisdom you expected from doctors also, once upon a time. You expected that they'd know you, they'd know the community from which you came, the 
stresses in your family, the stresses in the local area, the factory that was closing down, that they'd know all these things and they'd be seeing you from week to week so they'd see the difference in you. But there was one thing a doctor could do for you starting from the 50s, which no one else, including your grandmother, could do, although she probably thought she could do it better than uh, the doctor. The doctor could poison you. This is what medicine is. It's an art. It's magic. It's a bit like a plane taking off from New York to Los Angeles. I can't ever work out how these things with three or four hundred people on board and a ton of luggage gets off the ground. It's the same with medicine, which was you give a poison and out of the use of a poison you bring good. Or you mutilate people. That's surgery. That's what it is. And out of a mutilation you bring good. That's the extra thing a doctor can do for you. This can only be done safely in a relationship where the doctor knows he's poisoning you or she's poisoning you or they're mutilating you and these days where they're working with you. That's not going to happen all that easily in a relationship where the drugs are prescription only. Prescription only status is an ad which uh, appeals to me. Her body, her choice. You can see that clearly and you may not have seen that the image has changed. There's a little bit there at the bottom now. My decision. Okay, this looks like, you know, her being empowered. It's not. It's up to me to decide what we're going to do here. This is an ad for an oral contraceptive, which is available on prescription only. Prescription only was introduced as a system to control addicts in 1914. The two drugs that were prescription only were heroin and cocaine. That was extended in 51 to all new drugs because of their risks and because doctors at the time looked like the kind of people who could put the pharmaceutical industry in its place, partly because the pharmaceutical industry was a very small operation at that point. In 62, it was, this was copper fastened in place because doctors know all about medicines. But as far as I know, there's not a single medical course on earth where doctors are thought about how companies market to them. They don't know the critical things about any medicine. So, <clears throat> in risk.org, our idea was to follow the Venus and Furs model. For those of you who haven't read Venus and Furs, worth reading. Um, I don't think uh, you know, the movie gets over uh, the same message as well. What it's about is this guy perplexed by women. Now, what's changed there? Um, but he comes to the conclusion, the extraordinary conclusion for 1870, which is that we've got women there who are beautiful and intelligent and bright and sharp and great, but they're also irrational and emotional, from the male point of view, you realize. And he concludes, really, that actually what's happening here is that it only appears to be this way because they're not educated in the same way as men, they're not given as much money as men, that it's all about power. Level out the playing field as regards power, and everybody's going to look equally rational to each other. I mean, it's going to be clear women are more intelligent and more courageous than men. The only reason it doesn't seem to be that way is because of the power imbalance. And that's what risk.org is about, as you're going to see. On the theme of sex, though, to take it before and to bring the antidepressants into the picture, you all know that the antidepressants can cause sexual dysfunction. The first reports of this were from 1961. The thing came to, a, to the fore in the, uh, the 1990s. It was only around 2005 that the first reports, however, appeared about post-SSRI sexual dysfunction. And there have been reports as well about PGAD. Um, if you don't know what that is, Google it and check, okay? But this is the extraordinary thing about this. It was eight or nine years before 2005, I had seen the first 
patients that I saw who had permanent sexual dysfunction following an SSRI. It's extraordinarily common. It's very like the tardive dyskinesia of the antidepressant field. It's one of these things that can appear only after you go off the drug. The message we've all had is, oh, yeah, 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 the antidepressants cause sexual dysfunction. The clinical trial literature doesn't show that it's 80 to 90 percent of people who have uh, the problem. The message was you hold the drug and everything goes back to normal, and where's the problem with that? Even if I want to go away for the weekend and have a good time, you just hold the drug for the weekend and everything will be fine. That was the message. It's not true. Within the first week of when you go on an antidepressant, you may have a sexual dysfunction that lasts for up to 18 years after you stop. That's the, length, that's the longest period of time we've got in the group of patients who reported to us. It can go on forever. And it can happen within the first week that you go on these pills. It's like tardive dyskinesia in the sense that it'll often just appear once you halt the pills, which is a great mystery. It happens all ages, it happens men and women, and the question is what happens to children who are put in these drugs who haven't even begun to go through puberty? What happens to the women who take drugs during pregnancy who are exposing their child to these drugs that can do this? How many people are actually affected? Well, it's thousands. We don't know how many thousands. I guess the other half of this question, this may leave you all feeling a little unsettled, is does anyone who takes an SSRI actually go all the way back to normal? I don't know the answer to that. You don't know the answer to that. And that's the problem we all have. That's not just true of the antidepressants. It's true of osteoporosis drugs, asthma drugs, cardiac drugs, not that they all cause you to be unable to make love, but they all potentially cause comparable problems like this where we know nothing about what's going on. Let me hop back for a second. Um, caress fibers. You look at the people round about you and you think we're doing great things in terms of trying to explore the brain and how it works and things like that, and we're really making progress. Well, you know, we've known for 200 years that we've got nerves and that nerves carry different kind of sensations from the periphery to the brain and things like that. This is all obvious stuff. Physiology 101. And nerves come in three or four forms. There's alpha nerves and beta nerves, and there's C fibers, which people have been paying no heed to for a long time. These C fibers are subdivided into caress fibers. And in a sense, we all know about that, because when you stroke a person you love, I mean, if you put your hand in them, that's one thing. If you stroke awfully fast, that's a completely different thing. If you stroke at a particular rate, this is a caress. Everyone knows about this. Hairdressers know about it. It's mediated by a particular type of nerve fibers that have only been described a few years ago. There are basic things about People we look at, the things we see in people right in front of us that we know nothing about. This is what we think is actually affected. This is a group of nerves we think are particularly affected in PSSD and in SSRI uh, 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 dependence and withdrawal. Look at this. I thought I knew a lot about uh, the serotonin system, and I do. I've been working on it for 35 years at this point, so I know a little bit about it. Um, and uh, the BMJ actually approached me and asked me to write editorials about it. But this was a lady who dropped out of school, not this lady here, this is just um, referring, this image you see here is just re uh, trying to refer to an issue that a lady who came to us who dropped out of school at the age of 16, knew nothing about healthcare, has no degrees in the area at all. She cracked the problem, which is that SSRIs can make you alcoholic. There's a lot of people who go on SSRIs who become alcoholic, and if you stop the SSRI, the alcoholism vanishes. Nobody believed her when she went along to a GP and said, look, take me off this SSRI. I think it's causing the alcoholism I have. He said, no, don't be ridiculous. We give SSRIs to people who've got an alcohol problem because they're depressed. We think that's driving the alcoholism. AA said exactly the same thing to her. This is alcoholic denial that you've got. In the end, she was able to persuade her GP to change the pills around based on what she told him to do, and she cleared the problem up completely. And while she was researching this and doing all this, Lilly and Pfizer 
And all of the major companies in the field were doing the exact same research and come to the exact same conclusion as she had. And most doctors that you will get put on an, an SSRI by no by know nothing about this. So there's expertise on the one hand, and there's motivation on the other. And motivation counts for a lot more than expertise. If you've got the motivation to solve a problem, you can move mountains, particularly if you're a woman. This is another aspect that most of the women, quite a few of um, uh, 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 the women who've reported to risk have crystallized out for us. There's a lot of perplexity about getting hooked to SSRIs and what gets called these days protracted withdrawal syndrome. I think, well, there's 10% of the population in the United States who are on SSRIs these days. And 90% of that, 10%, that's nine out of every 10, are on these drugs and cannot stop them. They may feel hunky-dory and they may feel unwell when they come off the drugs and attribute that to their recurrent illness. It's not. For the most part, this will always be dependence and withdrawal. So we've got an extraordinary public health issue here. My hunch is, based on the reporting to risk by people out there who are on these pills, that it's not protracted withdrawal. Well, we put a great part of the complaints people have are things like this, burning hands and feet, our pain around the body, our tinnitus problems, our anosmia, are a range of different things like this, which are a peripheral neuropathy. Now, the good news about this is it doesn't seem permanent nerve damage, it does seem reversible, but we've, what we're hoping to do is to create within the next short while a withdrawal forum on risk. And we need to crowd research how to solve the problem because it's got to do with C fibers that people know nothing about, which have got TRP1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 receptors linked to them. And most of you in the room know nothing about these things, and no one else does either. But between us, we can crowd research it. That's the hope, at least. So, but a bigger aspect to risk is this. The idea was you go in there and you report a problem you're having on a drug. You generate, we take you through a bunch of questions that provide a score. Is this drug linked to the problem or not? We generate a report that comes with a score that you take to the doctors put you on the drug. And the hope is that he or she will endorse or not say, well, look, yes, you have a real problem, but I don't think it's this drug. It's of the eight drugs you're on, it's this one over here or whatever. But at least they'll engage with you. They'll listen to you. And in the course of trying to do this, we've become aware that while people can report extraordinary things about the drugs, can, people who know, who've dropped out of school early can teach me about the serotonin system. Motivation is hugely important. This, the place where it runs into its biggest hurdle is just this, having the nerve to take a report about a problem you're having to a doctor, because you instinctively know that most of them are going to be hostile. That's, that's where this cartoon comes from. And this is my Snoopy and Furs cartoon, as you're going to see. Uh, so this is, you take a risk report to uh, the doctor, and the response you're going to get for the most part is, don't be silly, don't be ridiculous, I'm the expert, what the hell do you know about these things? Uh, okay, so the doctor, the idea was to equalize the power between the doctor and uh, the patient so that he, he can't blow you away in quite the same way. Well, it turns out that they can get fairly nasty. The thing is, how do we turn this round? This is Snoopy and Furs. I love to hear a doctor beg. Okay, um, so the idea is just like Venus and Furs, we need to equalize the power relationships between doctors and us. This applies just as much to a doctor who has been treated by other doctors for other problems. We need, what I told, what I tried to say to you earlier was the media programs you hear about. Most people out there hear a fairy tale. They see they, they may go along and see Bort and things like that, and they see a fairy tale, the good guys, the nice guys saying there's a problem, 
And the idea that we have when we make these programs is that if a few of the good guys are just let's say what they think, it'll be an emperor has no clothes type moment. Everybody will listen and say, oh yeah, the emperor has no clothes. Well, that's not what happens in the real world. Bought and a bunch of programs like that have been out there for a long time and they've made no difference. The, the world does not respond to little girls for the most part saying the emperor has no clothes. We need a different kind of fairy tale. It's more uh, uh, one that's come from the United States as uh, opposed to Europe, a Wizard of Oz type fairy tale where someone who isn't a doctor persuades a scarecrow and a lion and a tin man that they've got brains and they've got hearts and things of like that which they didn't think they had. And the guy behind the curtain is increasingly shrunken and much less powerful than he likes to portray himself as. So the hope was linked into all that, the hope, one of the ways to change things we thought is not all doctors will respond hostilely. A lot of them, one in ten, my hunch is there's of every ten doctors, one of them is going to respond hostilely always, and they really shouldn't be in clinical medicine. They should be with FDA, or working in pathology, <laughs> or something like that. One in 10 will listen and say, oh yeah, when faced with a choice between the evidence and Chris here saying, this is happening to me on this drug, they'll go with Chris and junk the evidence. This, this sounds like it's real. Let's explore it. If the evidence is saying it isn't there, there's something wrong with the evidence. Now we now know that there's a lot wrong with the evidence, okay? So there's a lot to be said for listening to Chris. There's eight out of ten in the middle who at the moment like a shoal of fish are going with the evidence, but they're not constitutionally stuck that way. They will move back to join the rest of us that want to listen, who think it's, I mean, jo the job is more interesting if you listen to the person reporting on a new drug, something no one's ever heard about before. You know, this is interesting. You can help them, but it's also interesting. So that's, that's the hope. If we get people reporting back that this doctor listens, we can build maps of doctors who listen, and as we do that, we can change the culture of medicine. That's the hope. Which brings me to the last slide, which is this one. That's the whole phrase. If you go into Wikipedia, it'll say that this phrase comes from Emil Zapata in Mexico, that it's a very revolutionary phrase. It doesn't come from Emil Zapata. It comes from Ireland. It comes from the Irish Land League. It comes from a person called Michael Dabbitt in the same year that Venus and Furs was written. It was the, this is the movement that gave rise to the boycott. Now, what I think we need is almost the opposite to a boycott. We need a way not to boycott doctors, our companies, our pills, but to talk up, okay, to, as opposed to going quiet and not talking to them, to speak as loudly as we can. This drug causes that. And the more of us who say these things, the better the chances are that we can change the culture of medicine. Thank you.